the processor and he duly offered us um, the equivalent of about $50 each for the day's work. And I thought, well, that's just, you know, too hard. <laughs> Absolutely too hard. I'll go back to uni for that. And um, as a result, we thought that there's got to be a better way. So we thought, right, this is an incredible product. It's got a bright purple shell, bright purple row. It's clearly really unique. Um, and rather than it just being shucked and rowed and put into two kilo frozen blocks, we thought, nah, there's a better way to do this. And uh, so we would get the scallops, process them onto the half shell, put them into a poly box, fly them to Sydney, jump on the plane ourselves, drive around Sydney selling these to the emerging foodies of, of the early 80s uh, in Sydney, trouser a heap of cash, head home and do the whole thing again. Quite frankly, I haven't been able to uh, rediscover a business model as much fun and as profitable as those early days. But what it did leave me with was this indelible desire, in fact, drive to only ever work with brands. So the Coffin Bay Scallop became quite an icon um, and it was quite identifiable. And, you know, truth in labelling, I mean, we know that in our industry, there's a lot of wet, cold, smelly, slimy, lying, cheating, thieving pirates. And, um, and that's often just the good guys. And uh, that truth in labelling is something that we, we grapple with on a, a daily basis. And uh, certainly it's quite, it's quite topical now with the country of origin labelling, but I won't even get onto that soapbox and have that discussion right now. But the point being is that once you've actually worked into the brand environment, you have some level of security because at the end of the day, fraud is fraud. So that's what Fishtails does. And that's the background to where I come from and why I'm so driven about, about brands. Um, thanks, Ben, we may as well flick through that next one. Ooh, that's same, same, but different. Let's move on to the next one. So what we're gonna do today is have a look at a bit of a brand study and a brand value equation. And, and um, I don't know if anyone can recognize that guy in the photo there. Ben, can you receive any input from, from your screen as to if anyone uh, has not, I No one's... Uh putting into the chat window yet, but I'm monitoring carefully. Okay, well, we might come back to that and see how everyone goes, but just bear that grumpy old face in mind as we go through this story and, and see what we can, uh, see if anyone comes up with it. So let's start, shall we? Let's have a look at this whole concept of what a brand is. Next slide, thanks, Ben. So first and foremost, a brand is not a logo. Everyone, you know, in our world tends to think that branding and logos are exactly the same thing, but in fact, the brand is actually the name that's given to the product or service that it takes its identity on. And in that sense, the actual, what is called the device or the actual logo is merely a part of the whole brand journey. And the whole story of developing a brand is way more than just the device. The next foil things. Ben. So branding is a way of identifying our business. And that goes beyond just the logo, of course. It's about how customers recognize, identify and experience our business. And that reflects everything across the business, not just the seafood, not just the product. It's the service. It's the level of, of everything from packaging to performance in the pan. And a strong brand is reflected in every aspect of their business. But more importantly, the brand is the DNA of what you do. Your brand is your DNA, but and even more importantly than it being your DNA, it's your goodwill. Now, goodwill can sit on your balance sheet. For those of you that, that are looking at your balance sheet every year and thinking, well, what's the value of my business? Goodwill has an incredible amount of value in any good branded business. And in fact, if we look at even, <coughs> excuse me, um, Nike, for example, that has a has they on their balance sheet, the goodwill of the Nike brand is in the vicinity of about $35 billion US dollars. And McDonald's at the other end of the scale is about $129 billion. Um, so should we have a look at the next slide? Thanks, Ben. Sorry about this, guys. We had a bit of a technical hitch, otherwise I'd be driving this. And then while we're talking about the value of these brands, I mean Coke's around about 36, 37 billion, and Apple which of course is the first trillion dollar company, their brand value or their goodwill is estimated at around about 360 to 370 US billion dollars. So if you can understand the purpose of this whole branding exercise, it's not just about having a little fun logo, it's actually about building equity for the business. So the brand is a promise. 
And what does this promise mean? The promise is of the total experience. It's got to be different from that of your competition, but at the same time, it's got to be really relevant to the customer. And it's got to be able to deliver and deliver and deliver. And you've got to be able to deliver and deliver and deliver against that promise, not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the day after. Because if you don't, and if it's inconsistent, then your brand actually stands for inconsistency. So if you really want to actually get any value out of going to the trouble, the effort, the energy and the expense of building a brand, then you've got to make sure that you deliver against it. So just as when you're building um, you know, a boat or a factory, <coughs> excuse me, you've got to be able to make sure that it can be delivering day in, day out. The whole concept is that we need to, oops, hang on a sec, I think, there we go. Drive awareness of the, of the promise is installing in the minds of those who really matter. Um, now we've actually miss, messed up a couple of those foils there, Ben, sorry. Can you go down two slides, please? And then we'll come back to those. Yeah, go back one more slide and then we'll go back in a sec, sorry. So we're gonna go through today what it is to develop a brand. And the elements that we're gonna be talking about are the five core pillars, which are who we are, who is our audience, how do we wanna to talk to our audience, what is our personality, how do we render our brand, and then how do we deploy it? So if we go back up to slides, sorry, Ben, we'll start with the promise. You know, great brands are built by actions, not words. And to that extent, what we're looking to be is different, be compelling, be vigilant, be relevant, be focused. And the great brands always say, use me. They always say, you're the guy that I want to go to. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the promise of what our brand actually means. Next slide, thanks, Ben. Whoa. Branding is strategic and marketing is tactical, but they live together. So it's often said that people, people will often forget your, your name and they may not know what you're selling, but they'll always remember how you make them feel. That's what your brand is and that's what the brand relevance is. So when we have a look at this next slide and we'll talk about the, those elements again, this is what we need to be looking at when we're developing a brand. So a lot of people in the seafood industry just merely think that you just race out, get your uh, niece or your auntie or your sister or someone at the pub to uh, trace around a 20 cent piece and you've got a logo and that's all you need to do. Well, if you're gonna do that, then don't bother. Keep selling your fish through the local co-op or through an intermediary and do what you like, but that won't actually deliver you what we call as equity. And it won't build you the goodwill that you're actually looking for. <clears throat> There's actually quite a formal process that, that we go through in these five steps. And it's important that you take each step seriously. And it's important that you actually undertake to spend a fair bit of time investing uh, in this process and making sure that it is about delivering against what your business mission is. So let's have a look at these in a little more depth. On the next slide, we go to, who are we? Now, this is really important that you go through this process yourself before you race off and speak to an agency like Ben's or mine or anyone else. You know, it's important that you actually do the hard yards in just trying to understand who you are and what you're actually doing. You know, where are you from? <coughs> Excuse me. As we all know, provenance is one of the greatest uh, pinch points in, in food marketing in the world right now. And, and I dare say that in the last 18 weeks, that has become more relevant. Where you're from is really, really important. And it's not about just coming up with a jingoistic brand, a jingoistic logo or name. It's actually coming up with what actually differentiates where you're from from where the next guy's from. So you need to be thinking about what's unique whether it's you know, Port Lincoln or Port Moresby, it doesn't really matter. You've got to try and think, what are the unique selling points of that region? What do you catch, grow, or provide to the market? You've got to think really clearly as what is special about what you do? If there's nothing special, then why are you doing this? If you genuinely think that you can actually differentiate 
yourself from the next guy in the marketplace, then you need to be able to make sure that that actually has relevance and you can actually articulate it. You've got to be able to say what it is that you do. And you've got to be able to do that, I reckon, in less than 10 seconds. So you need to think about that clearly, write it down, try it out with someone else, distill it, try it again, distill it, try it again. But you've got to be able to describe what you do really clearly, really quickly. That's really important. You've got to also think about the customer. What are the business problems or issues that you're going to resolve for them? Are you going to make a, a, a meal that they produce more attractive to the consumer? Are you going to make their profitability better? Are you going to teach them how to use your product such that they can actually make more money out of it? Are you going to be able to get it to them more consistently? Are you only going to be able to get it to them seasonally? These are all the sort of questions that you need to ask, not just yourself, but ask your prospect customers. This is an investigation. This is the work that you've got to do in this po whole process of, of brand development. And most importantly, you've got to think about what is your USP, unique selling proposition? What makes you special? Now, I know that every fisherman and every aquaculturist think that what they do is really, really special, but you've got to actually be somewhat objective. You've got to take your product and look at every other product in the marketplace and consider it objectively. Are you genuinely better or is it just because you don't see anyone else's product? Are you really knowledgeable of what the competition is? Do you really understand the end game? I mean, you know, that's part of the process. If you want to be able to sell to the high end restaurants, you've got to understand what the high end restaurants are all about. There's no point sort of perceiving that they don't know what they're talking about. And you do, if you don't understand what they're looking for and you don't understand what your unique selling proposition is. So it's really important that you go into this investigation with a, with a very open and clear mind. So the next part of this journey is we need to understand who is our audience. Are we looking to sell to trade buyers? You know, are we looking to sell here on the auction floor at the Sydney fish markets? Or are we looking to sell to the wholesalers? Are we looking to sell to chefs? Are we looking to sell to consumers? Are we wanting to talk to the media? And all of these are important. I'm not suggesting that there's necessarily one and not the other. It could be a combination. And when we start to have a look at some of the experienced, uh, experiences that we've had in journeys through our clients' portfolio, you'll understand that we tend to look at that holistically. We look across the supply chain to all of those different touch points of, of trade. Buyers from the fishmongers and the wholesalers, to distributors, processors, retailers, consumers and media. We need to understand their point of view on the seafood that you're trying to sell. You've got to get out, you've got to get into the market. Only you can experience that. You know, I often ask my clients to come with me on a journey around and just understand what's going on. You know, we had a fantastic experience with our mates from Austral when uh, we were working with them to bring their amazing sub-Antarctic toothfish to market under the brand Glacier 51. And uh, Dylan Skins and I did, uh, I think, about four or five weeks on the road. Our team visited something in the order of 1,400 restaurants in, as part of the investigation before we even started to determine exactly what the product was. We'll talk about that a little further, going, a little more going forward, but I think it's just really important to understand that you've got to really investigate who your audience is and understand what they're looking for. You've also got to understand what's the secondary audience. You know, is there something here that we can actually sell to the, <coughs> excuse me, sell to the media? So the next part of this exercise is how do we want to talk to our audience? What sort of relationship do we want to have? I mean, do we want to be flirtatious? Do we want to drop in and out? Or do we want to get married? What do we want to do? How do we want this audience to actually understand who we are and what we do? And I guess importantly, we need to also understand, you know, what are we really looking for from their response? Are we looking them to buy the product today, our seafood today, tomorrow, the day after, the week after, the month after, next year? Are we seasonal? Do we know that we're only going to be around for 12 weeks, six weeks? What do we do in terms of being able to, how we speak to the audience is, determined by what all of those desired responses are. 
And I guess we need to, through this process, try and distill it down to a single message that is going to be able to really turn the switch on when we want people to buy. It's no point having gone through this process and investigated the market and understood who our audience is and then not know exactly how we're going to speak to them. Let's have a think about what it is that we need to do, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of building the personality of our brand. Can we go to the next one, please, Benny? So what exactly is the personality of the brand and how do we want to project that to our audience? You know, what's the tone of voice? Who are we competing with in this space? What are our personality stakes? And where are we going with our personality? Now, these might sound like really vague concepts, but what we're trying to do is understand exactly who, where, and what we want our brand to speak to and how it's going to speak, how it's going to resonate. Don't know if anyone recognizes that. It's Miley Cyrus. And I don't know if anyone's seen, but Miley Cyrus has just done a cover of the uh, great Blondie's Heart of Glass tune. And it's really incredible to have seen Blondie's brand reflected by a third party. Get a chance. If you go on YouTube, have a look at it. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But the whole notion is that the per Blondie's personality has been projected through a third party. And I think that's really what we're talking about when we say, how do we want to project our personality? It means it can be picked up and taken elsewhere by someone else and still retain the integrity. And that sounds kind of weird, but it's, it's really, really important. If you've ever gone to a Mercedes dealership, whether that's in Los Angeles or Sydney or Stockholm, the way that they sell their cars is exactly the same. That brand experience is exactly the same. The personality of that brand is exactly the same. And that's kind of what I'm trying to reflect here. So the next point of, along our journey is how do we render our brand? So we've spent our time, we've got on the road, we've got into market, we've spoken to everyone from the guys in the markets, guys in retail stores, distributors, processors, wholesalers, and we've spoken with consumers. We've gone to restaurants, we've spoken to chefs. Ideally, we've, we've actually even reached over, the, reached over the kitchen pass and spoken to a few customers. It's really important. And from all of this, we're gonna distill our findings. And then we're gonna write a brief. And it's up to you to write the brief for your design house because now we're getting towards the logo end of the equation. And whilst I was dissing the idea that a brand is not a logo alone, the logo is an important part of the suite of assets that you need to actually build your brand. And when we get to that, <coughs> excuse me, when we get to that process, we need to be able to make sure that we are indeed uh, in a position where we can, um, where we can understand exactly what we're trying to achieve. We need to, be, we need to be recruiting our branding allies who are graphic designers, web developers. We need a good printing house. We need a good social media strategist. We need a great photographer and video, videographer, and we need a good content manager. Now you don't necessarily have to be all of these people. You might be, you might have a cousin, a niece or a brother that is part of that, but it's up to you to make sure that you actually are distilling the findings of your investigation and rendering that into the brief that goes off to these branding allies. It's really important. You know, if you just go to a design house and say, listen, hi, I'm, you know, Bob the Barramundi fisherman and I'd really like a nice logo. I can guarantee you nine times out of 10, you'll come back with something that you hate. They'll come back with something you hate. If you go to them and you say, hi, I'm Bob the Barramundi fisherman and I'm from Bremer Bay. And Bremer Bay has got a beautiful backdrop of mountains and we catch fish that are four to six kilos and we only catch them by hook and line. And we put them on ice straight away and we take them straight to market. And it's a really special fish because we only catch them from April to September. There's much more chance that the design house, the photographer, the videographer, the social media content provider are going to be way more in tune with who you are and what you want and what you need. So having that brief, even if you can't articulate it brilliantly yourself, you know your product better than anyone. And it makes so much more sense for you to be part of that process. The other thing that I'd advise when you're thinking about looking at these branding allies 
is to not scrimp. I mean, you know, I don't know how many times in my career I've been able to, you know, draft a, uh, uh, an investment proposal for a client, if it's for a piece of equipment on the back of a fag pack or a pie bag, at six figures, multiple six figures, if it's a, you know, an engine or a piece of catching equipment or a piece of harvesting equipment or whatever. But often, you know, just trying to get, you know, five figures out of someone to spend on the building of their brand assets is like I'm asking for their youngest born. But it's really important because if you think about it, a really good brand suite of brand assets is going to last you at least 10 years. And that's, um, you know, an important part of the process of this journey, that that investment up front is, is really important. Now, how are we going to deploy this brand once we get through there? If we go to the next slide, sorry, is still part of this journey. So we've briefed our branding allies and we now are beginning to understand what it is that we are trying to, to do in terms of deploy. How are we going to use the brand? Where is it going to be going? Why is it going to be used? And when is it going to be used? So these questions might seem post the exercise of briefing our designer, but in our, des our branding allies and our design house, et cetera. But in fact, we need to start this process of thinking of how we are now going to brief the people that are going to be using our brand. So our upstream partners, be they trade partners, be they chefs, be they consumers, or even be media. We need to be thinking constantly. Now that we've got a clear vision of what our brand is shaping up to be, who it is, what our personality is, even indeed what our look and feel is going to be, we now need to think about how we're going to be deploying it. We go back to our branding allies and we discuss this with them. And before the job is finished of building the brand, we then go into the next slide. Thanks, Ben. And we come up with what's called a design style guide. So by this stage, we have all of our deliverables. And the thing is that you, on the right hand side of this foil, which sorry, it's changed its, uh, its uh, look and feel from when I set out. <coughs> we now have, um, we need to have our assets all developed. We need a great library of photography, of videography in a whole range of different formats that are ready to de deploy and use. We need all of our materials that have been developed in print ready format. Um, we need to make sure that we've got how these brand guidelines, how they're going to be used, colours, fonts, nothing worse than going to all this, all this investment and then finding that you, you know, let it loose to the market without being able to have control over it. Nothing worse than having a fantastic, really brilliant product that is let down by its brand strategy and worse let down by its asset library that isn't controlled. So having a style guide at the back end of this that is developed by your, your branding ally partners that will ensure that every time your brand gets used in its physical sense of the, the logos and devices, that there is consistency, it's recognisable, and that it will make sure that not only the tonality, but also the personality of your brand is reflected every time it's used. And that's really important. That's really important. Okay, we might, are there any questions at this stage, Ben? Whoop. Um, yeah, uh, no, I'm just been monitoring the chat. Um, so we had to have one from, from Marshall actually. So, so branding is more about provenance than about the producer, question mark, particularly with seafood. Well, I think that they are very, very closely related. And this comes back to that point that we were making about the personality of our brand. I think that provenance is, is, very important as we discussed before, but so is the producer. And people are wanting to know, they're wanting to have a nostalgic relationship between the source of supply and what they put in their mouth. And it's, you know, it, it really is important to be able to tell that story across the whole brand. And, you know, in the seafood industry, we've got some amazing personalities in terms of people as well as brands that can be, can, can share that, share that spotlight. So I thought what we might do now is just have a look at a couple of examples of what I've been talking about in a practical sense in some of the journeys that we've taken with clients so that we can actually explore what that actually means, what we've been talking about and how that gets applied. So, so our really good friends at Kinkawooka Muscles, um, uh, Andy Puglisi and the Puglisi family, 
are probably one of the the um, the great examples of um, of this work, if you will. And when we first started with them, um, you know, it was a relatively new business that that the family had moved out of the uh, tuna ranching business and and had uh, started building mussel farms with Andy Dyer in in Boston Bay in in, in Port Lincoln, and we arrived to find a fantastic team, a great business, an incredible growing environment in Boston Bay for, for bivalve mollusks. Um, but we needed to sit down and really understand what it was all about. So in that next slide, Ben, we've got what our mission was. And it was really to try and understand what we could do with this small, soft, sweet, fast growing mussel that came from the West coast of South Australia that was, you know, variously 16 to 28 hours from market, whereas most of the competition was between two and six hours from market. Being a bay mussel, it, it tended to come out of the water and, and, and drop a lot of liquor quite quickly. It doesn't have the same strength of the adductor in the, in the mussel that the, say the big oceanic mussels from Victoria or New South Wales or Tassie have. And of course, we were incurring all those additional costs in terms of both freight, packaging, ullage, um, as those were from, from other parts of the world, uh, other parts of Australia. Now, Kinkawuka is the family company name. It means good, good water in, uh, in the local Aboriginal dialect. And whilst it was a really hard one to, to consider as, as actually the personality of the business, it was the personality of the business. And once we started to use that, in the manner that we ended up doing for 15 years, which was just tell the story about the provenance and the history of, of where the mussels came from, but also of the, fam the Puglisi family. That, that all meshed and formed into one. So we then had to, had to look at the other issue, which is the next slide, thanks Ben, which was some of the challenges. How were we gonna differentiate this mussel from the west coast of South Australia? It was more fragile than the oceanic mussel from Tassie or Victoria and New South Wales. How are we going to be competitive? How could we improve the value back to the farm? And how could we grow the market? And so we spent a fair bit of time with, with Andy Puglisi trying to establish what was going to be the most convenient way to take, and not just convenient, but safest, most secure and surest way to take the product to market. Now, one of the challenges had always been that a muscle typically drops 5% of its body weight per day out of the water. So obviously if we're sort of variously, you know, two to three days to market plus two to three days going through the market, there's every chance that, you know, it'd be fairly light. So the historical process was to overpack boxes of loose mussels to go to market. Well, this didn't make a lot of sense for anyone in the whole supply chain. And so a fair bit of work undertaken by Andy Puglisi and Andy Dyer and, and Result was the modified atmosphere pack of, of live mussels with, uh, with water in the pack. This not only kept the mussels you know, in really fantastic condition, but it meant that they were selling a kilo, the customer was buying a kilo, and the end user was using a kilo. So all of a sudden, the tyranny of distance was eradicated. The other part of the exercise was to make sure that we could tell this story with this name that no one could pronounce in a really easy and genuine manner. And that's why we chose to retain the Kinkawuka name and the device itself, which is the purple, purple shell, or the purple uh, watermark was reflective of the color of the shell. So it actually spoke to all of those elements of the story that we were talking about. From there, we then, to the next foil, thanks. <coughs> we then really had to work hard on making sure that people understood who Kinkawuka shellfish was and what was unique about the, the mussel from Boston Bay. Obviously, it was much smaller, but it was soft and it was really sweet. And we found that there was a really strong message in promoting it from a seasonal perspective. So the season typically starts in sort of late May, June. And whilst they're available year round, they are in absolutely killer condition through to about now generally most years. So we use that to deploy the brand in marketing execution, very much around the, um, the, winter, the winter time. Um, and that's 
and and so a lot of our marketing execution was very much about the whole process of of doing this seasonal promotion a seasonal celebration and we used that in a range of different activations in things like the pound and pipe promotion where it was, we were trying to actually get consumers to eat a kilo or you know eat half a kilo perhaps and so the idea of it being this sort of idea of a great winter meal that worked really well in that environment was what we built the brand around. So a lot of our marketing activation was all geared around that, that winter time. And then we had to move forward with the time <coughs> and there was, there was an evolution. So over, over the 15 years, we had to keep reminding the market that there was this new season that occurred during the winter. And then we thought, right, okay, as, the, as the, the pub scene started to change, we needed to funk things up a little and we moved the brand into a bit more fun and we moved the, the devices uh, from being that original classic beautiful design uh, where we started to appropriate some of the industries, Murray the Muscle, which was the story that the industry had come up with about you know, not being scared to use um, closed muscles. And... Um, he appropriated some of that with some fun stuff and we deployed that across new markets. So again, we had to keep this brand evolving and right through to, I think we should be able to play on this next screen, Benny. I think if you, can we get into yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know if that's working for me, John. Sorry about that. Um, okay, no problem. All right. Is... Okay, so where we took the brand then, <coughs> was to work with some brand partners. So we undertook a, a national campaign with Barilla Pasta. And that was a little video that was prepared to cross merchandise the Barilla Pasta with the Kinkawika mussels. Um, and so we shared brand equity between this pasta, which was seen as an everyday kind of meal solution with mussels, which we were trying to drive towards that Tuesday night dinner solution as well. So, I guess in terms of this brand equity story that we've, we've been driving towards, you know, when we, 2003, the commodity value, wharf value of mussels are around 40 cents a kilo. By 2020, the pre-packed wharf value is around about $3. And the value added product value going into the next generation of the Kinkawika business is probably more likely to be in the order of like $4.20. So the purpose of this whole brand equity building process is actually commercial. It's not just about getting the jollies, about getting a brand out there and getting someone's name out there and, and, and winning delicious magazine awards or, or you know, South Australian Seafood Industry Awards or Sydney Fish Market Awards, which the King Kawika brand did. It was actually more driven by the prospect of building the value of the product. And so that really was what that was all about. And I you know, feel pretty proud and, and, uh, and excited about the way that that, that actually worked. We might have a look at the next case study then, Ben, because this one is, is, is really interesting as well. We were lucky enough to be working with uh, Hiramasa Kingfish from the late 1990s when it, it um, was commercialised by the South Australian government uh, across into five farms. Um, and of course, um, our mates at Clean Seas remain the, the final farming operation now, I believe, in, uh, in the yellowtail kingfish world. And so we, again, we undertook an investigation before we really started anything and you know, spent a lot of time up and down the east coast of Australia talking to everyone across the trade um, from wholesalers and distributors to retailers, chefs uh, and, and food media about what this thing was that's called kingfish. And uh, one of the issues that we discovered was that pretty much anywhere above the 30th parallel or Sydney and Perth, it had a fairly dubious reputation for at least six months of the year because people didn't trust its capacity to be cooked. It could be a beautiful fresh fish, looked amazing, could eat deliciously as sashimi, but it hit heat and the flesh would go to pap with uh, the naturally occurring microsporidium kadoa affecting the flesh. So the Spencer Gulf kingfish, the kingfish being grown in the Spencer Gulf had this unique growing environment where it didn't get subject to Kadoa even during the summer. So we needed a means by which to immediately differentiate it in market. And we chose to use the name Hiramasa, which is the Japanese name for this species of Seriola, Lalandi. 
And we can go on to that next slide, thanks. And so by about this, you know, the middle of 2007, I think, um, the Clean Seas Group had purchased most of the, uh, purchased all of the, the kingfish farms in the Spencer Gulf by that stage. And so the idea was what had started it was almost as a, an industry brand became a proprietary brand in terms of the Hiramasa, Hiramasa Kingfish. And really what the challenges were, if we go to the next slide, was to really build on the fact that here was a fish. Thanks, Ben. Next slide. Sorry, mate. Yeah. <clears throat> here was a really unique fish. It looked very similar to its wild cousin, which particularly during the winter time in southeastern Australia, there was you know, a lot of fish around, but it looked very different. The flesh looked different. It had quite different culinary characteristics to the wild catch, but there was a lot of wild catch around. And there was this issue with cooking. And it, it's, to this day, there is still, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fish that requires a fair degree of skill if you're going to cook it with, uh, with great success consistently. Um, you know, if, if in the wrong hands, I mean, if that's, if, if, you know, if it's left on a barbie for half a can of beer too long, it can often uh, dry out. And so part of the challenge in terms of building the brand was to really, for us in the first stages, was to focus on the raw market. And I think that the, uh, the, the whole process was to make the brand experience for the consumer to be very much about this being a really luxurious raw fish. So we'll go to the next slide, thanks. And so we really played hard on that Japanese nature of, of the branding and, and the next slide, thanks, Ben. <coughs> Excuse me, of the Japanese branding. And we actually used that katakana, the, the traditional Japanese text in the, in the branding. And we used, uh, in fact, it was, a great, it was a great exercise to do. We used the young face of Chanel at the time to, uh, to, to actually align with the fish. And it wasn't any sort of play on sexism. It was more about the fact that here is this beautiful fish. Hi, John. You know, um, just a little uh, time warning. We're at 4.40. Um, so it's either another five, five minutes and maybe another 15 minutes of questions or another 10 minutes. And no, so no problem. I'm, I'll, be, I'll be three minutes and 47 seconds, Ben. All right. No worries. <laughs> so we used, we used this alignment between the beautiful environment from which the fish came, the beautiful nature of the fish itself, raw fish being typically seen in, in very fine uh, elegant environments and we married all of those concepts together to come up with the beautiful fish. Since then that has moved on to uh, the next slide, thanks Ben, where after time, after that, uh, after about 15 years, the, it was time to try and move that fish forward. Now the business Clean Seas uh, elected that they, for purposes of actually drawing back to the uh, the provenance of its of its uh, location of its farm, they they um, chose to modify the brand a couple of years ago to Spencer Golf here in Master Kingfish, so that they could be speaking with customers whether they're in in Stuttgart, Shanghai, or San Francisco, and draw it back to this primary message of the beautiful water, uh, cold, clear, clean water, uh, and the fact that it was an oceanic. Uh, ranged fish because of course right now there is a lot of recirculating aquaculture systems being developed around the world and one of the unique selling points of the Spencer Gulf Piramasa Kingfish is its provenance. So that's been the, the mandate over the last few years. Second to that has been them wanting to migrate out of exclusively owning that raw fish market uh, position or being very strongly positioned in the raw fish market to try and activate center of plate uses in other preparations. Hence why there was a lot of education undertaken to try and teach the market how to use, how to successfully cook the Hiramasa without ending up with uh, something that was you know, compromised. So if you, uh, if you have a look now and you go to uh, uh, clean, the Clean Seas website, it'll take you through to a whole host of trade activation programs that actually are teaching end users gently how to use the fish. Um, and so that's been a really interesting exercise in brand evolution as well, is that we've now actually had to undertake moving from introducing it, it from the introductory process 
to actually now an education process. And that's, you know, again, the thing with a brand is that it's living and you've got to keep moving with it. It's got to keep moving and evolving as it goes down its life cycle. Um, and it's timely that, that clean seas have been undertaking that work because they have more competition now than they did previously. And so that, that's quite relevant. So Ben, my last slide here was, was actually, it's a bit of a note, it's a you know, non-event now because we can't show it, but it was the wonderful John West salmon video from, uh, that was done by um, Ogilvy's in London in 2007 which shows, if you go to YouTube, you can pick it up, um, shows the salmon fisherman who is the John West, who was our man at the very start of this presentation, probably the fa most famous brand, seafood brand that's ever been developed in the world, fighting the, uh, the grizzly bear in the, uh, in the rivers of Alaska for the, for the salmon. Um, again, the point about that being, aside from it being a beautifully produced ad, is the fact that the John West forget. Here we go. Look at that. You got it, Benny. Tastiest, most tender salmon, which is exactly what we at John West want. John West endure the worst to bring you the best. So that, that's always appealed to me as being one of those fantastic pieces of, of brand evolution because they've kept that brand really fresh for, I think it's nearly 35 years now. And, um, you know, that's, that's what this is all about. So, look, that's, that's my brief story about, you know, what I believe to be the brand journey. Um, I think it's really exciting right now in, in seafood. I mean, in the, in the 30 odd years that I've been hanging around it, uh, the category. I've never seen more demand for the knowledge of provenance, history, uh, and usability of seafood. You know, pe we've got this really luxurious position. We've got, you know, we've got the health benefits on our side. Um, we've now got this sort of unique opportunity in terms of this uh, demand for knowledge from consumers on our side. I think it's just such a great time to be telling the story, and building our brands is such an important part of that. So it's really about getting all of your ducks in a row or all of your fish in a row and making sure that you've done your homework, you've put in the hard yards, you've made the right choices, you've built the program and you've built your brand. So do, what do you reckon, Ben? Have we got any thoughts or questions? Thank you very much for that, John. So, so enlightening as always that building a brand isn't just about what you say to the consumer, but you know, what you say to the whole chain from beginning to end. Yeah. And it's always good to see the way that you think, from the very water all the way through and your knowledge of seafood comes through and that and it's so important when it comes to all that middle of the chain marketing um, and producing a compelling story for the consumer as well. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we can um, get your opinion on. Uh, so this, is, this one's from Marshall. So branding is more about provenance. Oh no, then we've done that one, about the producer. Yep. Uh, how hard is it to get a brand that involves incorporating a regional name? Well, okay, so a really good point. I mean, I tried to trademark Coffin Bay in uh, 1984 for our scallops and I wasn't allowed. I mean, that, it's, it's very difficult to trademark a, a region. In fact, you can't trademark a region, but you can trademark a device. I've kind of always been one to think that, um, you know, it's, it's about, you know, promotion of, the brand and if you choose to incorporate a region in your brand it's about promoting that the region within other elements of your brand so it still might be mount cook alpine salmon but we actually talk to the market about so many different elements of the fish aside from the fact that it comes from mount cook that in fact people you know will take it up as alpine salmon or they might take it up as, as mount salmon or whatever um, but it's a really, it's a really good point, and I think you need to be aware that you won't be able to register or trademark, <coughs> excuse me, trademark a um, a region of itself, but you can uh, actually register or trademark the device. So you might have a logo that builds into your brand. Mm. But I, I, I do think that there is a very strong argument to say, you know, that 
when it comes to, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of producers always want to see their brand on a menu. And of course, for clowns like us, that's our job is to try and drive menu presence. But it, you need to think about that carefully as well, because if you want to call yourself, um, you know, Ben Hale's Barramundi, there's more chance than there is if you're going to, than if you're going to call it, you know, sort of brown table Barramundi. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that that is, and it depends again on the market segment that you're, you're actually targeting because that will, that will really also de determine. I mean, there are a lot, of, a, a lot of folk for whom, a lot of food service business and retail business for whom the brand may not be the driving mandate. You know, there are a lot of people that are still selling on price and price tends to sometimes be at counter odds to, to, to brand. I think that example that you, you gave of Kinka Worker going from 40 cents uh, on, the, on the wharf to $4.20, that's a, that's a tenfold increase. And that value is purely attributed to brand and, you know, and, and processing improvements and re, rethinking how, yeah. it all, how it all works together. And that leads us to just the next question from Steve Lewis. Uh, in such a margin sensitive industry, how do you gather the investment in brand when everyone is scrapping for share? And two, is there a, a good percentage question. spread in general you see from a well-evolved brand? That's a really good question. I mean, look, one of the really interesting points about this whole discussion is, is this concept of investment. And as I think I referred to um, half jokingly before about the fact that I could on the back of a fag pack probably extract half a million bucks out of a client for any investment in plant or equipment. And I'd struggle to get 50,000 for a marketing campaign. It, it does really reflect how our industry needs to recognise the value of brand equity and how that gets built. Uh, my chums in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods or in beverages, they often are looking at, you know, somewhere between 12 and 14%, 12 and 15% of revenue being invested in marketing, which most of which gets invested in branding. So like, you know, when I'm scrapping to get one cent in the dollar or 1% of revenue to be invested, it makes, it makes it a really tough exercise. I think you've got to be realistic. If you wanted to go to market from, you know, and, and look, there's some really important things to remember here. If you wanted to go and launch into say Woolworths or Coles with, with a branded product, it's going to cost you somewhere between 180 and 250,000 to do the merchandising uh, if you want to do a proper job of it. If you, want, if you want to just throw your product at the market and hope it sticks, no problem, go for your life. But if you really want to try and drive it, then you've got to have a fair, decent allocation of resource to make sure that it's going to actually work. I think that you should make sure that you are actually recognising that this is an investment. We spoke earlier about the asset suite, the asset library. You know, I would be looking to allocate somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand dollars to build an asset library that can last you ten years. So five grand a year for a suite of beautiful videography, photography, great logos, a style guide. I mean, and that's probably on the cheaper side, Ben. You know, but I think that that you know you'd need as a starting point to consider that that is the value. But you'll get that back in spades if you do the execution with the right level of sophistication. That's it. And that 10, 10 by multiplier with Kinker Work is a great example. And I know from Love Australian Prawns is a you know, $400 million industry. Uh, and we're competing with all of the big proteins out there. But the investment, uh, the industry investment is about 0.07% or 0.06% of GDP. Yeah. But it really should be at around 2%. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, Ben. I think that I think that as a category, we've really underperformed. We, you know, we we are we are our uh, our own worst enemy in the fact that we we don't invest in marketing, and we yet we expect it we expect it to actually come to us. And mm -hmm. I, I just think that there is a new world order. We're competing for plate presence with every other protein, not just with other seafood, not with imports, but with every other protein. And you know that pressure is going to get more. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's the current infatuation with plant based center of plate protein is, uh, is, is driving us to the margins unless we are prepared to back ourselves in. Mm, absolutely. We've got two more questions uh, and seven more minutes um, from Joe Rusco. I'm interested in the case of Hiramasa Kingfish, read the disconnect between provenance and the adoption of the Japanese branding style. Um, I guess I'm not. Okay, so Joe, what we what we were trying to achieve there was to recognise. In fact, part of the part of the branding was that it was you know um, Australian born and Australian raised, but a Japanese product. 
for some in some in some respects. And by that we meant the consumer market. You know, we were trying to drive a raw consumer element. We worked hard on building the provenance story back in there, but about cold waters, but not as much as the business is doing now. So Clean Seas now is working much harder on their provenance than we were in the early days. In the early days of the brand cycle, we were trying to get the fish in people's mouths. The fish itself had a bad reputation. Uh, because of the experience, as I said, you know, for for consume for even you know amateur fishermen that had caught a fish in in Brisbane in summer, you know, there was one in three chances of that fish being edible if you put it on a barbecue. Um, so our primary job when we were developing the brand was to give it that sense of luxury, and give it that sense of usability, and that's what we it looked to do by saying, well, who eats the most raw fish in the world? The Japanese. This fish in Japan is regarded second after bluefin as the preferred sashimi species. So let's leverage that. Let's leverage those points into our brand story. And, and that's why we weren't playing the, the provenance card as hard as we were playing the usability card. We always told the story. And if I could show you a suite of library of material from 15, 17 years ago that always drove the provenance in terms of where this fish came from as part of the story. But in our batting order, it was probably lower down than, than usability. Right. But it's a good question because I think that there is a really, there is a really important and something that we skipped over in this presentation is that there is a batting order of relevance in how you actually position the, those different elements of the investigation. You'll find these. So when you go to market and start talking to everyone across the supply chain, you'll be getting all of this information. And it's from this information, you then render that batting order of relevance. And some things will shine out. Like, for example, when we were doing the work with Dylan and, uh, and Austral, we were bringing the, the toothfish to market. And we did these, I think it was like, some, it was over 1,200 restaurant visitations. We found that in excess of 80% of the chefs that we spoke to had never even eaten toothfish. Never even eaten it. So, and, and it was over 90% had never used it. So... <laughs> it really posed to us that we needed to undertake a huge job in telling the story about how to use the fish. Again, it was awesome that we could tell this fantastic, you know, high seas adventure tale of it coming from, you know, the 20 metre swells of the sub-Antarctic and hence why the Glacier 50, 51 name came about because that was the glacier against which the skippers set their, their charts to drop the long lines to catch this amazing fish. And that was all part of it. But in terms of the batting order, we actually had to put again usability at the at first and foremost. You know, by comparison, the Skull Island tiger prawn story was very much more about you know sort of coming where it was from, and Skull Island drove that whole campaign. It was the provenance that came before the usability in terms of the Skull Island story. And how lucky that there is an island called Skull Island in the Gulf that has got you know surrounded by beautiful turquoise waters. It was just. It was uh, a wonderful Absolutely. opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, you know, like we're digressing, but it's a, it's a really interesting point. I mean, a company like Ostra, and, you know, I, I declare openly that, they're, you know, not only mates and we love them dearly, but they're also clients, um, you know, have almost got this unbeatable batting lineup. You know, they've got sustainability, they've got provenance, they've got world's best practice. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to almost choose which is the best story to tell. So we always have to keep going back to the market and asking the market what are the most relevant points of reference for them. And that's, you know, I don't think we should ever forget that it's, it's the customer who will drive your brand experience. Mm. All right. Well, with three minutes to go, um, I'm just scanning the questions. I think there's one more. We've got one from an anonymous attendee. Do we have the same multinational investment push as exists from the Asian and European countries? Are they better than us? Really good question. I think that's a really good question. If I, and I, you know, as many people know, I have a particular position on the country of origin labeling. Um, and I will stand on my soapbox for one minute. Sorry, Benny, is the fact that I, I get frustrated with our, you know, our industry's um, expectation that legislation over motivation will drive a market. I completely disagree with that. Um, but what I find really interesting is that I don't see too many importers standing up and trying to motivate the market either. So here in our little old island of Australia, I think that we are somewhat quarantined from that process. But when I go, to, when we all go to the international seafood shows around the world, or we go to international markets, 
we see some amazing execution. Um, you know, people like Schooner Bay, people like, you know, uh, Aura King Salmon, our mates at Mount Cook, um, you know, they're, you know, the Giardos out of Western France with their oyster companies. I mean, there are some really fantastic executions. And I think that there are, there is a growing, as we, as we're seeing, sorry, Benny, I'll take one more minute just to describe this, but as we're seeing more investment coming into our category and more professional investment, we're seeing a much higher level of demand from these professional investors in professional marketing. And therefore they are driving this demand for you know, an investment proposal around really good, strong branding. Mm. Uh, excellent, excellent. Well, I think that um, brings the Q&A session to an end. I just want to thank John so much for his time um, and thank Pleasure. all for the attendance. Uh, it's been a really well attended uh, webinar and um, I think John's advice and insight has been of, of great use. Uh, we're just about to launch into the second part of the uh, Sundown series. We've got some great speakers lined up uh, for the next session from KPMG and Nielsen. So this is all about understanding your market, uh, researching your consumers and knowing your consumers and adjusting you know, your practices and your marketing to, to suit that. So uh, once again, John, Perfect. thank you so much. We'll be in touch with uh, all of you with uh, details of the upcoming seminars. And just wanna thank you all for attending and thank you so much, John, for your time. Eat more fish. Yes, eat more fish and prawns. <laughs> <laughs>